Well, welcome. <laughs> welcome, everyone. Um, this is our first workshop in a series of related climate uh, climate. We're calling it our climate record keeping series. Um, we initiated this workshop because we had some farmers that were working with us that were really noticing a difference in um, their profitability and yields from year to year when we've had really dry years and really wet years and just noticing how that impacted their um, crop planning activities, their crop projections, their markets, um, things like that. So we wanted to put together a workshop series to help farmers think about different kinds of record keeping strategies that you can use to both monitor what's happening in the field and to your finances as we're dealing with climate change and unpredictability from year to year as we continue to grow and develop our businesses. So thank you to all the farmers who shared your concerns with us to be able to put together this workshop um, series for you to hopefully help give you better tools um, to manage um, the differences that you're seeing year over year in your businesses and just to improve your overall business health and profitability. So just a quick background, um, I'm Jennifer Hashley, the director of the New Entry Sustainable Farming Project and just wanna thank our staff here, Kimberly, Freddie and Nanin and others who have been helpful in putting this workshop series together. Um, just a quick uh, introduction and tech check for our series since we're online, for any of you who are still relatively new to online learning. If you want to rename yourself or add your pronouns um, to your name on Zoom, so if we have discussion later on, folks can call you by your name that you prefer to be named. And if you want to add to the chat your name, pronouns, where you're coming from, your farm name, anything about you so um, we know who's in the room, that'd be great. And we just ask that folks keep yourself muted until we have our Q&A session and feel free to add any questions to the chat as we go and we'll be monitoring that as Kian is presenting so that if there's something in the moment that you're confused about or need more clarification on or just have a question about feel free to pop that in the chat. And then we are recording the sessions um, so video is optional but definitely when we move into the Q&A discussion it's always nice if you want to show your face so we can feel like we're having a more intimate conversation and not just talking to blank screens. Um, and just a quick background on the new entry sustainable farming project. Um, our mission is to improve our local and regional food systems by training the next generation of farmers. And our goal is that um, new farmers get into the business to help grow food that's sustainable, nutritious and culturally um, relevant to everyone um, in the community. And we are located in northeastern Massachusetts in Beverly on the ancestral lands of the Pawtucket and Massachusetts people. And we run three main programs here at New Entry, our farmer training programs, our food hub, and our national field network. And in our farmer training program, we do all kinds of courses and workshops um, and run an incubator farm program where we make land accessible to folks for up to three years and provide equipment and technical assistance and other things. Um, just a little highlight on um, this spring, we will be starting our crop production course again. It's an eight week long course. If you want to get some practical hands on experience in um, organic crop production, encourage you to check that out. Uh, we run an explore farming workshop about every month or so. Um, and then we are, we'll be starting our farm business planning course that will begin again in January. So we're in the current session right now. But if you're interested in taking a class to help you really develop a startup business plan that is all online as well, you're welcome to sign up for that. And we have a lot of, uh, we have a tour of our site here. If you're interested in the incubator farm, you can take a virtual tour. A lot of our prior workshops and things are posted on our YouTube channel. Um, we also run a food hub, as I mentioned. So if you do come through our programs and you're looking for more market access, um, that's another opportunity to, um, to sell to a food hub that helps um, connect local consumers with local product. We also do some trainings, food safety training and other trainings through that program as well. Um, and then we run a national network of land-based training programs across the country. We do monthly networking sessions. We just had our national conference in Kansas City. So there's other ways to engage if you're not from the Northeast, but would like to be connected to other folks doing beginning farm of work across the country. So as I mentioned, this is um, workshop tonight is a series of other online record keeping and financial analysis workshops. So I know it's really small on this slide. But um, this is the first uh, part one of our series on bookkeeping. And then um, we'll have another break even analysis and scenario planning workshop in December. And then we'll dive even deeper into sensitivity analysis and competitive analysis, looking at your books. And then we'll um, talk about market channel risk assessment and market channel analysis. We'll look at how you can leverage your point of sale market data collection to make better decisions. And then we'll talk about um, access to USDA programs and resources and other um, safety net programs to help you manage um, climate risk. So 
that's the those are the free workshops um, lined up there. You can register for them on our website. And um, we will be posting resources from the workshops each week to, um, I'm assuming this is where we're going to put them, but we have already a lot of farm financial management resources um, on our website. You can find that by going to the resources tab over to the farmer resource library. And then there's another side tab called farm financial management resources. And we will be creating little fact sheets coming out of each of these um, workshops and posting them to our website and linking them to the recordings that will be posted on our YouTube channel for this series. So I think um, because this is a grant funded workshop series, the funder does always require us to make sure that you learn something from the workshops. And so um, Kimberly, I believe we have a, a short little poll that we would like to ask folks um, about their knowledge of bookkeeping systems. And so that should pop up on your screen shortly and you can fill that out um, as we get started. And then at the end of the workshop series, we'll send out um, a more detailed evaluation to see if you have been able to put into practice or made any changes in your business as a result of what you've learned here this evening or in other workshop um, that we will have moving forward. So please uh, take a few minutes to complete the poll here. And then we really do appreciate you filling out the workshop evaluations at the end of each session and at the end end of the workshop series itself. Um, and so the next, um, I wanted to just introduce um, tonight's speaker and a little bit about the CARE project. I don't know, Jeff, if you're planning on saying a few words, but uh, Kian has been uh, farming for, for quite some time now, which is great, and uh, has been growing, I love this, both the soil and financial records and systems at his own farm uh, for over a decade here. And so he's taught for us before um, in a workshop that we did last year and has been working with the CARE project. Um, doing these trainers and business advising um, with the CARE project as well, and has developed a nice specialty in all the things that we're going to learn um, this evening. So thank you so much, Kian, for um, your expertise this evening. And I will um, just say thank you to our funder, the Northeast Extension Risk Management Education folks at the USDA National Institutes of Food and Ag for funding this and um, supporting this series. So I will stop sharing and turn it over to you, Kian, to get us started. Thanks, and thanks for having me and us back um, during the, the summer. I'm just, well, myself and my wife. The picture that you showed is actually a picture of both of us um, that was edited. I'm pretty sure when I uh, spoke at a, at a new entry uh, conference many years ago, that was the picture that was used. And so I wonder if that was just somewhere in your, in your like archives. Um, but that picture is a picture of myself and my wife standing in front of the greenhouse or the high tunnel that we crowdsourced about 12 years ago because we couldn't afford one. So if you're ever thinking I'm struggling with my finances, me too. Everybody does. We're all uh, kind of in it together in agriculture, which is sometimes a wonderful thing and sometimes very frustrating or both at the same time. Um, so today we're going to be talking about multi-enterprise record keeping, um, some practical strategies for production and financial records. I will say that there is no way to cover everything that you are probably going to want to talk about on this subject all in one slide deck, particularly not in a couple of hours. So make notes as, you know, of, as to what you might have questions about and what business assistance you might find really helpful um, as we go. And then we'll be able to talk about those things either later or one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so I also have all of the, all the funding we have all the funders. It's very important that they're recognized because they keep us informed as, as farmers. They're investing in us and our ability to become more profitable, which I appreciate. Um, today, I'm working with the Carrot Project, um, and we are based in New England, although uh, much like New Entry, there is some extension past that. But uh, the Carrot Project is really looking to help within the uh, food system to build a just and resilient farm and food system, um, specifically supporting agricultural businesses, securing their futures. I like to think of it as our futures by breaking down financial barriers and building our paths to sustainability. So it's really about supporting the farmers and the other aspects of the food system, food producers, um, in terms of what we can do, but there's also education, advocacy, and research. So this is the education part um, and it's nice to know that all the organizations that are part of this are really supporting each other, 
because we don't always get to see it as farmers. As we go, there are space for questions at the end, but if you have something that's really eating at you, um, I can't necessarily see it if you raise your hand physically, although there is a button for that. Um, you can also type things in the chat window. I can't keep track of everything, so Jeff is gonna keep an, <coughs> pardon me, an eye on the chat window for me. Jeff is the plant, he's from the Carrot Project. If you end up uh, looking for business support from the Carrot Project, you will talk to Jeff first. So there's Jeff. Um, he's he's very friendly and he is happy to answer or voice uh, questions you may have in the chat window, especially because we're recording. I like to let people know that I understand. I am one of those people that doesn't want to ask the question by voicing it. If I feel like I didn't understand something, I can get really nervous about that, especially if it's being recorded and putting on put it on YouTube. So. I understand that. Please feel free to chat it, or put it in the chat window. Jeff can voice it for you. Um, chances are pretty good that if I have lost you or you have a question, someone else does also. This is a different picture of me, um, but I'm, I want to point out that I started as a farmer and became a consultant. The nerd part has always been there, but I decided to uh, find, I found an opportunity. Um, I found an opportunity to turn the knowledge that I was building as a farmer into a way to support other people. And I found that was really a wonderful thing. So if you have any questions about geeking out about vegetables, we can do that at another time. Today, we're gonna to talk about financial records and operational records. But um, as, as was pointed out, I'm gonna be back. You get to listen to me again next month, talk about break-even analysis and scenario planning. And again, in February, for sensitivity analysis and competitive analysis. And I think of these things as kind of building on each other. So if you don't have your questions answered today, if it's something about um, any of these topics, we'll get there. I know it's hard to be patient, but we'll get there. Today, we're gonna look at bookkeeping complexity. Um, I am assuming that a lot of folks have some kind of books that they're keeping and that we're kind of updating and making more complex of those books. If you are not really keeping your books at this point, this may be a little bit confusing for you, but just hold on um, and reach out for support and we can get you set up to get more of that support there so that you can kind of catch up to the conversation um, before next month if possible. We're going to talk about when to invest in software and then some things about operational records, um, what to record, how to record it, and specifically using those to get your cost of production. And we're going to go over a tool that uh, the Carrot Project has developed called the Farm Financial Calendar um, that I have found very useful myself um, in terms of keeping, keeping myself on track. So the first thing we're gonna do is say that records, we think about them as being these things, right? They're your business dealings, your plans, your yields, your occurrences, but they're not actually these things. They're the things you wrote down. If you did not document it, if you did not record it in some way, it isn't a record. And that's something that we often forget. We have a lot of information about our businesses in our heads, and those aren't records. It has to be written down or typed out to become a record. And there are so many reasons to be able to keep your records and prioritize keeping your records. But ultimately, especially for financial records, being able to assess your business and plan for your business right now and as things change and making those best decisions, especially quickly as the conditions change and confidently being able to make a decision without spending a lot of time you don't have in the middle of the season um, to think about it and know that you had all the information that you needed um, at your fingertips. But also accessing financing, whether that's going into a bank or applying for a grant, government reporting, for non-tax purposes, as well as things like filing insurance claim or filing your taxes. I specify without crying, um, and that's very specific. I hope no one else has had this experience, but I have a feeling I'm not the only person who's cried while doing my taxes. I did, and then I started working with a tax preparer, and now it's a little better, and I got QuickBooks. That was the point I got QuickBooks, was when I cried over my taxes. <clears throat> Today, we want to talk specifically about framing our bookkeeping in terms of climate variability. There's a little bit more complexity now than there used to be. But as things change in terms of the climate, the nuts and bolts of bookkeeping don't change. 
the framing we use, the way that we look at or how the parameters we put in place for ourselves change. So we may change what we're, uh, what category names are in the chart of accounts. We're gonna change our financial goals. We may be planning more for those government reporting or for insurance claims. Um, there didn't used to be an option for a lot of New England, at least farms, to have crop insurance if we're on a smaller acreage. And there is now, and that's pretty new. So a couple of years ago, if you'd asked me if I had ever planned to file an insurance claim, I would have laughed at you. And now it's something that I would actually think about. Operational record keeping and climate variability is more variable. Because we're tracking variables in our record keeping, operational record keeping, we're going to have more of those things that we might feel like we need to keep an eye on, whether that's germination rates, um, which have been really variable in the past few years, uh, in at least where I am in the Berkshires, the yield per row foot or other standardized measure for the scale that you're growing on, the frequency of running irrigation, what kind of crop losses you may have, preparing for crop losses and making note of when those things may happen pest levels and response, as well as weather tracking. That's something that, you know, I used to just rely on the powers that be, mostly NOAA, to keep track of those things for me. And because I parcel farm, so I have parcels in different towns, even though they're not that many miles apart, the weather at each of those locations can be extremely different, especially during storms. So I've really prioritized tracking, uh, weather tracking a little bit more than I used to have to do but also things like rain at the farmer's market when you're trying to figure out um, what to bring and what that means to your sales. So to make that a little bit more distinct, financial records are the cash inflows, cash outflows, assets and liabilities, the money moving in and out of your business, what you've got, assets, and who you owe, liabilities. Financial reports are the things that we actually use from those. So we're going to look at that a little more detail later, but the idea is they're called profit and loss statement or income statement, cash flow, sales of product analysis, balance sheet, and then cash flow projections. Operational records are the things you're maybe more used to or have a pretty wide, broad range of what might be in there. And that includes things like seeding plans and seeding records, um, what kind of inputs you have on hand, what you produced, what materials it took to produce the product, your inventory, which in my mind and for the purposes of this list is your, the inventory of products you have for sale, systems tracking, staff records. All that stuff is operational records provided you are recording it in some way and writing it down. Generally speaking, details matter based on what you need in the end. So we're gonna be talking about different things that you wanna specifically record, but some of these things are really important and some of them you may find that you're not at yet in terms of, but the things that you can actually keep track of all the time, sales receipts are one of those things. You should be keeping track of some of these things more specifically. Some of them you may be building over time, like expected yield and actual yield per bed foot. But when you are keeping those, it's better to keep ones when you can and keep them accurately. So the sales rec receipts you're gonna be doing daily or weekly, inventory counts may be daily, weekly, monthly. For some people it's annually. You're going to be looking at what's going to give you the detail of information that you need for those decisions that you're going to need to make as a business owner. As we look into more detail in terms of financial records and bookkeeping, what is included in cash inflows? And I'm going to assume that you have some information about this, that you've heard these words before. If you feel a little bit lost, please try not to completely glaze over. Let us know, put it in the chat box if you have any particular questions, but we're going to go into, we're going to go back to some of these later. Um, so we may actually end up answering some of those. But in general, the things, the money coming into your business are cash inflows. And that includes the revenue. So the stuff you sold, the money you got from the stuff you sold, loans, money coming into your business from a financial institution, um, generally to be paid back with interest, grants um, from financing institutions, often not paid back insurance payments or owner's investment. Cash outflows is the money moving out of your business and it includes expenses, the things that you're paying for. It also includes owner's draw. Um, that's the amount that you're paying yourself or that you are receiving as a business owner. Um, and even if that's not there yet, might be a zero this year, but the idea is that that's part of the cash outflows and you wanna be able to build that into your plans. 
And then assets, the purchases of infrastructure that will be depreciated over time. Those are the things that you might be paying for this year, but that are building your capacity for revenue um, and profit in the future. And liability is the money that's owed to various people or institutions. When we're talking about bookkeeping, there's a point at which we have to think about that it is an investment and it's an investment on purpose. You have to make the decision to really focus on it to be able to reach your financial goals. So it takes time and it takes effort, but there's a reward that comes from it. The more time you put into the data entry, the faster the reports come back and the more complex your reports can be. So this has paper ledgers, Excel, spreadsheets, and software. I am really anti-paper ledgers in a long-term way. I think that if you need to do that to begin with, that's fine, but that it should really be digitized. And if folks are struggling to get things digitized, um, there's support for that, for getting people set up with the tools that they need to be able to do that. But there's so it's so hard to think about getting the information you need to make decisions at a reasonable, in a reasonable way and fairly quickly when you need to make those decisions, especially with the increased variability in the climate that paper records just don't cut it for most of us most of the time. Bookkeeping systems in terms of the digital versions, there are two main options. One is Excel or spreadsheet program. Um, I am pro Excel and not so pro some of the other ones on this one, but it depends on what people's needs are. Um, Excel costs less overall, but there are limits to that function. So you kind of get what you pay for to some degree in terms of those reports. You have to manually track your assets and depreciation. It's separated from cash flow. You are managing your database of information. But you can tailor that really specifically to what you need. The problem is the more tailored it is, the more challenging it may be to get business support. In terms of software, it tends to cost more overall. There are a few software options that are not expensive or less expensive, but some of them are a bit on the pricey end. More complexity costs more money, but you get more details and more categories out of it. So you can have a longer chart of accounts or a much more complex business that's all being tracked in the same database. It can also track your assets and depreciation, which is a lot less hands-on for you, which can be really helpful. You can automate your bank feed so you don't have to type all that information in. And that's a really big benefit for a lot of people that I've worked with over the years. And I find a big benefit for myself in terms of my using the software. Um, your POS imports may be automated. So you may be able to run information in terms of inventory, not actually keeping your inventory, but in terms of what's sold or how much is sold from your sales receipt and POS right into your software and not have to type all of that stuff in again. And then there's more support available. Generally speaking, if you run QuickBooks for your software, there's a lot of support out there for QuickBooks because that has been the business standard for a lot of businesses for a long time. However, that may not fit your needs. So figuring out what's going to fit your needs is a great conversation to have either with, <laughs> with a technical support person or um, with other farmers who's using what and what do they like, what's working for them. When you're thinking about investing in software, you have to kind of understand what it does. There are a lot of times where I feel like we're paying for things uh, that we don't necessarily understand. So it's nice to have a sense of that the software holds all of your data in the database. And instead of it being all of the data, when you ask it for things, generally in the form of reports, you're getting summaries. So your financial statements are summaries. They take the information, they give you back certain information in certain framing, and those are business standard to some degree, although you can also tailor some for yourself. So you put all of your expenses, sales data, and loan payments in, and you say, I would like to have a summary report of an income statement or a balance sheet, or a statement of cash flows, and you can get those reports very quickly out of your software. And the next question always is, what's a balance sheet? Um, the balance sheet is the way that books are kept. So in my head, and I'm going to apologize for the, uh, the Christian-specific imagery here, well, the connection to a Christian holiday. But in my head, the balance sheet is a bunch of rats and Kermit the Frog keeping ledgers in Ebenezer Scrooge's front room. That's the image that I have in my head. That is always what I think of. It's from a, a Muppet Christmas Carol, um, the most ridiculous and also the most beloved in, in terms of my families uh, of the Charles Dickens classic. 
But the idea of how do you keep a balance sheet, what does that look like? It was, and for some people still is, giant ledger books. And what it was and is, is keeping all of the information in balance. So everything goes on two of assets, which is what you've got. You have cash, inventory, equipment, buildings, and breeding stock. And then you have liabilities and owner's equity. That's how you got it. Liabilities are stuff you've borrowed for and you owe, you owe money for. And then the owner's equity is the stuff that you own outright. The retained earnings or net income, and then the investor's equity and owner's equity, the money you've put into the business and the money that the business to some degree has paid you, at least as we move forward. So what this looks like if you were to kind of break down software and be able to see behind the behind the curtain is that you have columns for assets, liabilities, and owner's equity. And I know that retained earnings is kind of a weird owner's equity, owner's capital retained earnings. There's just a point at which some of the words that we use in bookkeeping really come from like the Victorian era and they're just the same terms. It is incredibly hard to get a whole bunch of bookkeepers and accountants to agree on changing things. So retained earnings is not just the money that you've kept, it's a lot of other things as well. And so you just kind of have to learn what's contained in there. I apologize for the, the confusion that happens with that. So we're gonna pretend for a moment that you have started a brand new business and you have zeros all the way across the board, right? New business, no money. When it comes to looking at this in the balance sheet, there's always the equal sign and there's always the plus sign. Every transaction, every time there's any exchange of money, it is its own equation. It's its own um, assets equals liabilities and equity going across. And just like in middle school, if you do something to one side of the equal sign, you have to do something to the other side of the equal sign. That way it stays in balance. So if you're opening the business, you got a loan for $10,000. And then you turned half of that money into a tractor. It's still an asset. It's still stayed on, on the same side of, uh, of the equal sign, but it only was able to stay on that side because it was the same money turning from cash to tractor. And then you buy some seeds and supplies, which is on both sides of the equal sign as an asset, negative 2,000, and then as retained earnings and expense, negative 2,000. You sold some produce. You had $8,000 of revenue. Um, and you need to account for that also in the asset column. And then there's a year-end depreciation. So you're spreading out the financial impact of the tractor purchase over the span of probably five years because it's a $1,000 depreciation. And in the end, you have this lovely balance of uh, $11,000 in cash asset, $4,000 worth of tractor asset. You still have $10,000 worth of loan, you got apparently very nice loan terms that you haven't been paying it back yet. You still haven't put any of your own capital into the business. And then you have $8,000 worth of revenue that you've, you've earned this year and $3,000 worth of expense that you've expensed this year. So that ends up balancing out. So it's 15 on each side of the equal sign. This is all the information that's on the back end of your software. If you're keeping track of your own books in, in, a spreadsheet or on paper, this is basically what you end up having to do to keep track of them. When you have software and you ask it for a cash flow statement, it gives you this information, just this column. So if you're keeping these books by yourself in a spreadsheet version um, or on paper, this is the information that you would be turning into that statement. The cash flow statement is just the cash column. The income statement or profit and loss statement is just the retained earnings, just the revenue and expenses. And the balance sheet is the snapshot of where everything is right now. And now we're going to pause because that's usually when people get lost or very confused. How does everybody feel about that? Did that make sense? You don't have, there's no test, but is that something that you felt like you, you followed? I'm seeing some very confused faces. If anyone is feeling lost, please put it in the chat box so we can make sure that we don't lose you.
Okay. It seems like people are either doing all right or asleep. So I'm going to pretend that I don't think anyone's asleep and we're going to keep going. There's a dis very yeah. distinct. We have a quick question. How do you All right. How do you calculate depreciation? And can you explain the balance sheet again? <laughs> we're going to explain the balance sheet as we move through it. But yes, we can go through the balance sheet again for a moment. Um, so calculating depreciation is something that is often best done with a professional, especially when you're talking about if you're doing uh, depreciation on your taxes for something. Um, there are guidelines. So as you make larger purchases, you may be able to have that conversation with someone who's a tax preparer, or you may be able to find a list um, in terms of how you would do that on your taxes. Generally speaking, the idea is the same no matter what it is. The idea is that you're spreading the impact of purchasing an asset over the time that that asset is going to make your business money. It doesn't always work that way. As someone who has driven tractors as old as the 1940s, personally, those have been depreciated many, many years ago. But the idea is that you're going to expect the next however many years, often five to 10 years worth of um, financial benefit. And so you that's what the depreciation is, depreciation is supposed to be. That's how it's accounted for. So you're saying that I got, in the case of our previous example, $1,000 worth of benefit out of this tractor over the course of this first year. And that might happen for the next five years, and then you will count it as being completely depreciated. But depreciation is a tricky animal. So sometimes it gets, it can get a little fuzzy. And so I always tell people, it's a really good idea if you're buying assets for your business, and you're gonna be depreciating them. It's worth having that conversation with a professional and saying, what's the best way of doing this for my business and what's that impact going to look like? Um, so the balance sheet, the idea is that it takes all of the information for each of your transactions and lines it up as though you had a very scary middle school math teacher. Everything has to stay exactly where it's supposed to so that it makes sense going across and going down. When you're looking at a balance sheet, each transaction is its own row. Um, and so every time there's any kind of exchange, this is obviously a very simplified example. Each time someone was purchasing any kind of seed or supply, it would have been its own line, but that would be very complicated for our purposes. So if you're keeping this for yourself, it would be thousands of lines long potentially for any given year. But it's keeping track of everything that you have and putting it in the right category to know whether it's something that you have your own and how you got it. It's keeping track of all of the assets, the cash and the assets. We're using just the tractor in this example, but that may be, um, it may be a greenhouse. It may be a truck. It may be other expensive pieces of machinery. It could be implements. It's often bigger things. And we'll talk about what that means in just a second. Um, and then liabilities are what you owe people. And the equity is kind of how you how you got there. Did you put the money in? Is there money coming in from revenue? Have you paid that out for things that you're spending for this year? The good thing about software is that you do not have to mess with all of this stuff all the time. Um, but it's also worth knowing that that's how it works. Because I think that when we don't know how the software works, we can't notice when something goes wrong. Um, usually you don't engage with your whole balance sheet at this, you're going to get a balance, a balance sheet as a statement as opposed to your whole balance sheet at all times. When you're requesting the report of a balance sheet or if you're giving a balance sheet to uh, a bank when you're requesting a loan, it's a snapshot. It's just what's happening right now. So any one of uh, any at any point, you can do the math of all of the columns and figure out what that balance sheet is going to look like. It's fairly common that people don't do the math until they have to. Uh, the software keeps up on it all the time, which is one of the convenient convenience factors that we pay for if we're paying for software. So when you're running a balance sheet, it's what you have right now, what you owe right now, and where it came from, what's left right now. 
and it shows you those pieces. Does that make more sense? I got one thumbs up. All right. We're going to move forward because I think that the next, next example is going to help with that. A lot of people ask about that difference between expenses and assets. There's no hard and fast rule. It can depend pretty largely on the size of your business and what kind of investments you're making in your business. In general, expenses tend to be things that we use in, the, in any given year or don't have a really long lifespan. They tend to be $1,000-ish or less. They tend to benefit, the financial benefits are this year. So it's that you're using it this year. If you're using it, you may be buying it again or planning to buy it again next year. Um, assets tend to last a bunch of years. They tend to be more than about $1,000. And the benefit are really there in terms of supporting your business's profitability over time. The 1,000-ish is kind of a funny line because larger businesses have higher amounts often for what they consider an asset. And there are moments where it might be that something is less expensive and is still an asset. I'm currently working on a laptop that cost me, I don't know, maybe $800, maybe $850. I invested in a laptop. For the purposes of my business, that's functionally an asset. However, it was less than $1,000. Having gotten a less useful tool version of a laptop 15 years ago, it cost me $2,500 and this has more use to it. So as things change, it may or may not be that hard and fast thousand dollar rule. Um, but generally speaking, if you have a bigger business, that thousand dollars, it might be more than a thousand dollars. You tend to set a particular line for that. And again, if you have any questions about this, it's often really helpful to talk to somebody else, including someone who may be helping you with something like taxes. Um, in terms of figuring out whether or not something should be an asset. But looking at your bookie bank as a greenhouse, if you entered it as an expense, this is what that would look like. So we're going to say that you have um, you have $100,000 in revenue, you're doing pretty well. You incurred $60,000 of expenses, and then you purchased a greenhouse for $15,000. If you call that an expense and you're saying you're just, you're, this year, right? I'm going to, it's going to all be this year. I'm going to take all of that. At the end, you have an ending balance of $25,000. Your income statement says that your business, it, your profitability for the year is $25,000. Your balance sheet says that you have an ending balance of $25,000. Your statement of cash flow said you made $100,000 and then you spent $75,000. And so now you have twenty-five thousand dollars. It's a little redundant, but it's important to look at how those different things may look a little bit different. Now, the same purchases, all the numbers above that ending balance are are the same. We have a hundred thousand dollars of revenue, sixty thousand dollars of annual expenses. When you purchase that greenhouse, you say, "Okay, that's going to be an asset. I'm going to depreciate that over time." So, if you've made that purchase and you're not depreciating it until next year, you're looking at your income statement says that your business profitability is that you're, you're $40,000. That sounds a lot more profitable than 25. And your balance sheet says that you have $25,000 worth of cash, which is the same, right? Your cash money is the same. You also have a $15,000 asset. So you, there's more worth in your business. You have more as a business right now, according to this. Um, and you, your profitability is listed there as $40,000 within your balance sheet. And your statement of cash flow looks exactly the same because the cash is the same, right? The cash flow has not changed. It's really just a question of whether you called it an asset or you called it an expense. So we're going to pause again because that is another moment where people tend to get a little bit confused and I don't want people getting lost. The point is really that The way that you code things can really dramatically change, especially when it comes to things like financing. If you're walking into a bank, it could really make a difference how that looks. Um, and so you want to think about that if that's one of the things that you're looking to do in the future as you invest in your business. It, you you want to think about what that story is that you're telling.
All right, I got another thumbs up. So we're gonna we're gonna keep moving. To be able to have the information you need when you need it. We want to plan to organize your chart of accounts to extract meeting. So your chart of accounts are all, uh, they used to be called accounts, but that's one of those, you know, paper ledger clerks back in the Victorian era kind of mindset. <laughs> the idea of having categories and assigning things um, so that you can pull information out in a way that's meaningful fairly quickly is how we're going to set things up. So if you've looked at anything like this in the past, you're probably familiar with the idea of revenue, which is the money that comes into your business based on the product that you sell, the cost of goods sold, which I often think about as produce and products for resale. There are other ways to structure COGS. Um, and that's something that if you have things structured that way, it's probably fine. There's no one right way to do this. This is just the way that I think about it. And so since you uh, have to listen to me tonight, you have to listen to this, this uh, thought process. The operating expenses are really the things that we can build that meaning into very well. So I do it in six cardinal categories. I call them the Julia Shanks cardinal categories because they that's where I learned them from, but I set them up slightly differently. Uh, they're direct operating, labor, <laughs> maintenance and repairs, which are your variable costs, and then occupancy, one-time expenses, and overhead and general administrative, which are the fixed costs. Why do I call them that? Because they're alphabetized. And that way, if you have software, it automatically stacks them in that order. And then there's other income and expenses. And that's something that if you're not paying attention to, they'll get mixed in with everything else. And then your grant income would look the same as your revenue. And so then the year that I got a, uh, a grant to help me buy a tractor, um, thanks to all the taxpayers in Massachusetts, I would have looked like I had a really great year. But it wasn't actually my revenue that changed dramatically. It was just that the grant wasn't. So pulling that information out allows us to focus on profitability above that green line. And then the other income and expenses are things that we can not focus as much attention on. They're there and we can use them and see them, but we don't, they don't muddy the waters when we're trying to make decisions. So it used to be that there was often taxes oriented thinking to things. And now we really focus on extracting meaning when you're setting up a chart of accounts or as you adjust your chart of accounts. And the idea is that you can get you can get more meaning by changing what that structure looks like for your individual business and tailoring. But I want to point out that it's not that categories disappeared; it's just that they moved. Your production costs are still there. Your payroll is still there. Your administrative costs are still there. They're just in a different order because the different order makes it easier to read. Similarly, variable costs and fixed costs. If you are Thinking about the only reason to, if you, if you think at this, at some point that you're, the only reason that you're doing your bookkeeping at all is for your taxes and you're oriented just on that annual filing, you're not really going to be able to see this distinction. And so you're not going to be able to calculate your, your cost of production for your business or really have as much focus on what's going, what changes you might be able to make to become a more profitable business. So when it comes to variable and fixed costs, the variable costs are things that correlate with production output, seeds and seedlings, animal feed, labor and payroll. And then the fixed costs are things that don't vary with business volume, insurance, accountant fees, bank fees. In theory, as your business gets bigger, your bank fees should go down because you're less likely to do things like overdraft if you have a larger business. If you're going to have multiple enterprises, there are different ways to make it so that you can actually read those reports. And the whole point of all of this structuring is to be able to figure out what's going to work for you and your business so that you can read those reports and get as much meaning as quickly as possible. So to do that, there are different ways to do it. One is to do it in series. So you're doing it uh, less expensively. Um, each enterprise has a section of expenses to itself and reports always give all of the information. So you can't just look at any one thing without manually filtering stuff. So for a series, if you're doing your uh, chart of accounts with your multiple enterprises in series, there's going to be a lot more overlap, or you may do that. It may be the right fit for you if there is a lot of overlap. For folks who are keeping their enterprises in parallel, it's a little bit more expensive if you're having software um, because each enterprise has a column. 
reports can run with all the columns or some of the columns. So there's still some overlap, for instance, in terms of things like your bank accounts or your credit cards in parallel, um, but it's not as much. It's easier to just be distinct in terms of looking at one enterprise at a time. And then if you're keeping completely separate books, you have multiple files or multiple accounts with software. It's the most expensive option. It's like running multiple businesses because in terms of your books, you are running multiple businesses. The reports are exclusive to each enterprise and there's no overlap. It's theoretically possible to run separate books and share a bank account, but it's the kind of headache that is really, really not worth it. Um, so I do not in any way recommend that you try to do that. What that might look like as you're adding complexity for multiple enterprises is that if you're doing this in series, you want to ma match up your revenue as enterprise one and enterprise two, your cost of goods sold as enterprise one and enterprise two, and then your operating expenses also as enterprise one and enterprise two. That could look a little different depending on the way that that makes sense for your business. It might be that your variable expenses, the direct operating labor and maintenance and repairs are separated out into enterprise one and enterprise two, but your fixed costs are for the entire business. Or you might have fixed costs that are specific to each enterprise enough. For instance, I'm parcel farming and I happen to be doing things that have a lot of overlap. But if I had animals at one location and I had vegetables at another, I could very clearly say what occupancy costs went to which enterprise. So at that point, it might make sense to have all six direct operating, labor, maintenance and repairs, occupancy, one-time expenses, and overhead or administrative expenses separated into each enterprise. If you're doing this in parallel, it looks very similar, but you have columns for each of them. So instead of having them in one long line across the left or down the left side of, of your um, report, you would be looking at each of them in its own column. And then separate books, of course, are two completely separate charts of accounts. Um, the good thing about running books in parallel is that you can build that complexity in and see it kind of broken out. You can do the same kind of thing if you're doing separate books, but it takes doing the work over again in terms of putting all that information in if you're using software. And I want to point out that creating a chart of accounts takes time. It's a bit of an, an investment um, and generally speaking involves drafting or editing from what you have, um, working with it for a few weeks, editing it again, working with it for the calendar year, and then updating it annually. It's important to have help when you need help. Business assistance is really helpful in this process because it takes time and it's really useful to have someone else to bounce ideas off of when, it, when you're doing this. I have a business partner who happens to be my wife, but she doesn't engage with the bookkeeping in the same way I do. So when it comes to editing the chart of accounts, she doesn't want me talking to her about it because she's not necessarily going to see as much detail. So there's another business owner in the area who's another farmer who also, who actually helped me initially set up my chart of accounts, who thinks about it in the same way and we have the same program that we use for software. So when it comes to updating a chart of accounts, I might call that that person who's my friend and also my colleague and say, hey, can we sit down and do this? Like, can I borrow you for an hour? Um, and being able to do that, to have that support, whether it's informal like that, although she is also a, a business assistance provider, um, or it's formalized, it's really helpful because it's hard to do this kind of thing without having that, does this make sense kind of opportunity to bounce ideas off of something. And I know that as we go through different charts of accounts ideas, people are thinking about that ultimate tax filing that happens once a year and you end up potentially being very stressed out about. I want to specify that especially if you work with a professional to update your chart of accounts, you can, or if you're working, even if you're working on your own, you can designate a tax line for your chart within every line of your chart of accounts so that it's easier to translate. Any tax preparer or accountant, even without farm experience, should be able to do this, but especially those with farm experience really can translate a reasonable chart of accounts into your tax forms without a lot of stress, without a lot of time, which means more expense for you, right? So it's the important part in terms of keeping your books is keeping books that are meaningful for you as long as they're not, as long as you can do that in a way that doesn't make it harder to file your taxes, which if you're working, especially working with a professional, 
to make clear, or even if you just have that, those schedules, whatever you're filing up so that you can make sure that you're accounting for those things when you're building your chart of accounts, it's really not hard to translate to a tax form. Um, but of course, making sure that you have those separate lines, if they were gonna be reported on different forms. So if your business files multiple forms for the purpose of annual tax filing, having those called out and separated in your chart of accounts, as long as that happens, it's very straightforward. So we're gonna pause for a second and be able to take a stretch, grab some tea. I know it's hard to listen to somebody talk for two, for like an hour and a half, um, but I also wanna leave it open for questions. If anybody has any questions, we will go, we can go over more details of COGS. Um, I think at the end, it's not really talked about as much in this, but we do cover some of that in terms of um, some of the things that we do, I think next month or in February. Can we pause the recording for a moment and give people the opportunity to stand up? I always tell people to go, oh. if you have any tax questions for your business, they're actually, most states have offices that are set up to answer those questions at the state level. And they're very friendly. I knew someone who worked in the New York one. Um, so if you have any questions like that, if you don't have an accountant or if you do have an accountant and they're not answering your emails, um, please reach out to the business tax support lines at your state level. That's what they're there for. It's literally their whole job. Um, it's, I, I can help you with many things and your taxes is not one of them. Welcome back, everybody. We are gonna move from financial records to operational records. I know you may have burning questions about financial records, but if you have lots of questions, that's great. And you can email Jeff to get set up for one-on-one -on -one support, or we can you can ask them at the end um, of tonight. Um, but we wanna make sure that we talk about all of the different many varied things um, that we need to consider in terms of our oper operational record keeping with climate variance. The biggest questions really are, do you have goals for your farm? And do you have goals for specific enterprises? Most of our farms have more than one enterprise. So being able to set different and specific goals for each enterprise can be really key in terms of building profitability and resilience in your business. Ultimately, operational record keeping is the structure that we give or create to track our progress toward our own goals. And I'm being really specific about using the word goal. Goals are not things that you kind of want to do. They are realistic, achievable, measurable, and specific. That means that you can set a goal of, in any of the, the categories that make sense to you, and they're going to be a specific dollar amount or a specific uh, hour amount or profitability percentage. There are so many production goals, pounds, there are so many goals to set potentially, but they usually fall into one of these categories, production, systems and operational, financial and personal. Your personal goals may not be the things that you put in the business plan that you hand to the bank, but they can be really important and in fact vital to a lot of businesses in terms of being able to build resilience and profitability in the business. And then because this is how it works for business plans and one of the things I do during the winter is write business plans, um, I think of them as a one, three, five setup in terms of timeline. When do I want to set an end date for this, for me to achieve this goal? And I think of them as one, three, five, because that's how they're typically done in a business plan. But also that really works out in terms of how I think of things in my own business. What do I need to do really soon? What do I need to do pretty soon? And what am I going to get to in a reasonable timeline, but is definitely not happening in the next one to three years? That's how it ends up breaking down. Um, I know some people like to pretend that they can think out 10 years in advance. As someone who has been running a business for 13 years, I can tell you that 10 years from now, I have no idea what's going to happen. Um, I think that past five years, it's it's more aspirational than anything else at that point. You don't really have enough reality um, in your brain that many years out to be able to set good goals for that. You may have you know generic long-term goals, but I don't think that you can really set a timeline for it. So what those goals look like in terms of discrete 
those those very specific measurable things, we're looking at things like a revenue of five thousand dollars, and that might be a specific enterprise, or it might be the whole business if you have a smaller or new business. And then if you're if you have a goal of a specific amount of revenue, you need to be recording your sales in that enterprise to make sure that you're achieving that goal or to see how close you are to achieving that goal. If you have a three thousand dollars regular net for an enterprise, and that's the goal, and it's a dollar amount. You need to see what the expenses are for that enterprise so that in addition to those sales, you can see what the what the net is for that enterprise. If your goal is 25 hours a month increase in staffing for November and December, then you need to staff hour, track your staff hours for the enterprise. So <clears throat> you have to specifically tailor your recording to the goals. Otherwise, the recording is a lot of data with no immediate purpose, which tends to be the data that you don't keep up with. Um, one of the personal ones that I've loved that I've, I've seen with a couple of clients is farmers taking a day off. I have seen people do this as once a month. I've seen people do this as once a week. I've seen this as something that people have structured into their three-year goals and that at five years, they're hoping to maybe even take a day and a half off every week. Um, and figuring out how to track that, recording actually recording the days that you don't go to the farm is important because then you know how frequently you're currently taking a day off and how far you have to go to reach that goal. Um, and then things like having a goal of adding a value ent uh, added enterprise that contributes to the business net, you just have to be specifically recording the revenue expenses for the value added enterprise so that you can see if it balances above zero. In terms of operational records, again, these are the things you're recording, right? It's everything you write down for your business. It's everything, everything you write down for your business. The things you scrawled on the back of the seed, the, the seed packets are technically operational records, but if they're not in a reasonably easy to read place, if they haven't been put in a, in a structure, you're going to end up losing. So that usually includes things, at least for those of us who grow vegetables, of like seeding plans and the seeding records, the difference between what you, your aspirational, this is what I think is going to happen in December and what actually happens in July. Um, and then things like how much of what inputs do you have on hand? How much was produced? what materials it took to produce the product, inventory of product for sales, staff records, and photos. Photos is a key one. You may not have enough brain cells to think about all of your details of everything. You can always take a picture and look at it later. I have reconstructed multiple years worth of actual seeding records in terms of what beds things were in based on photos that I took of the fields. So I now have a practice of every month or so just walking through and taking pictures along uh, along the, the end of the beds so that when it comes time to do seeding records or seeding planning for the next year, I can see what crops actually went into what beds so that I can rotate properly. And of course, there's, there's the plans versus reality, right? What are you planting? Where is it? How much space? When do you plan to do it? Did it actually happen? If it didn't happen, why? And that's one of those things that we really need to keep track of in terms of the variability that we're seeing, the increased variability we're seeing in terms of the weather. I have had so much flooding in the past few years in some of my fields. I've also had droughts in the past few years in some of my fields. And sometimes it's the same year that I have the drought and then the flooding or vice versa. So figuring out how that changes the pattern of what I can actually do um, on the farm has really changed how I plan and what kind of adjustments I am prepared to make. When did things actually happen? When do you expect to harvest? How much do you expect to harvest? And of course, what did you actually harvest and when did that happen? And again, the detail is how much you can maintain. So that might be really basic. If you are only doing corn and pumpkins and squash, you might just have blocks of multiple acres of each of those things and cover crop, of course, and you have a, a planned and an actual date or, a, you know, that's, that's all you've got, but that's consistent. And frankly, if something went horribly wrong, this might be all the information you needed for reporting purposes. It really depends on what you need in your business. For someone who's running a CSA, this is a, I apologize for this. This looks like a headache for most people. This is a, an excerpt of my own seating chart. I have three, uh, successions of summer squash every year because I have summer squash for my CSA and my farm stand for, you know, four to five months, ideally. So trying to figure out what that looks like in terms of things like how to determine how much I need to purchase. When did those successions go in? 
I have a much less detailed version of this for recording in the greenhouse. This is the one for planning. And then from this, I can pull the information that I need and put it in specific places in terms of things like the uh, the seating bench and the harvest station. Just so that it's really clear, the maintenance, the consistent maintenance of detail is the important part. It's better to have simpler records and have them be consistent than to have complex records through June and then have no records for the rest of the season. And I've done that and it's not helpful for you as a business owner. It was not helpful for me as a business owner other than learning a little bit of humble uh, aspect of what I needed to be doing and what I how to frame that. I'm going to save you that year's worth of, of frustration and tell you that start with something simple and then build detail over time. And of course, prioritize the ones you need for reporting. If you have staff members, you need to be keeping track of things for payroll. If you have multiple enterprises and you need to know which one or which ones are really adding to the profitability of your business, and if something is draining money out of your business and not not uh, adding to it in terms of finances, you need to know what that looks like. So being able to prioritize what makes sense for you um, or for reporting if you have uh, insurance that covers some of your enterprises and not others, you need to be able to see what's going where. So of course, something simple, harvest tracking. Most folks who are tracking the harvest have how much was harvested, what area was harvested, when was it harvested. And then as you increase that, you may include things like what processing was done? Were there losses in processing? Who did what part? I'm a big fan of having people initial things so that you always know who did what. Um, how long did it take to go from the field to the cooler? That's one of those things that's more aspirational for a lot of businesses, but it becomes really key for some businesses some of the time. It might be that if you're growing a lot of greens, field to cooler is a really essential thing for you to be tracking during heat waves. That might be something that you're prioritizing some of the time at least to make sure that you can keep that pace that you need to keep the quality going. And then what were the weather conditions? The weather conditions dramatically change certain things. You know, It changes how long it takes um, to harvest what your labor looks like. It can change how long it takes to clean something. Um, <clears throat> it can change how long it takes to, to clean in terms of like pulling out all the weeds that you couldn't, you, that came up at the same time because of the floods and you couldn't get in to weed it. Um, or it might be that everything's dirty because it rained a whole bunch and that adds labor. And so being able to track things like that weather can really help in terms of informing what it really looks like um, to, to plan for things like staffing and timelines and quality. If your quality, the product of your, um, the quality of your product is not great at certain times and it's because of the weather, and that's often what happens, or pest pressure, you wanna try to make note of that. And it's often an easy time to make note of it on the harvest tracking sheet because you're looking at it. That's the time that you're really, you have somebody whose dedicated job for a while is looking at the produce. So use that person, use those eyes and make a note of it. The same thing with sales tracking. At first, you may just be looking at needing to know how much revenue, how much revenue came into the business and what sold, what sold and at what price. Um, and then you can add more information over time. Where did it sell? Was it at a different market? So you're looking at not just uh, not just what sold, but when exactly and where was it? If you have two markets a week, you might see one is a lot more profitable than another. To whom? If you're selling to wholesale or to, if you're selling to a bunch of restaurants, you might really get a, a better sense of your customers to see what each individual customer is purchasing. I track the customer purchases for my CSA members, but not for most other customers. Um, so if I'm working with restaurants, I'm gonna see, I'm gonna be looking at that specifically and I'll be able to track that. Um, or if I'm working with a grocery store on a regular basis, I'll be able to see that in, on my invoices. But in terms of, of um, CSA members, I wanna see if they're coming back, right? And so those to whom's became very important in terms of seeing who's coming back what does that look like in terms of my marketing? Who are my key customers? And that um, was something that I added in over time. And then what were the weather conditions? And that's something that's so funny to me because it's not something we usually think about in terms of sales, but 
if it rains this past season, it rained almost every Friday and almost every Saturday. Friday and Saturday are the big markets in my area, and it rained almost every Friday and almost every Saturday. And so those markets were significantly less profitable this year for a lot of people than they were the year last year um, in 2022 when it didn't rain all the time. Um, it changes things like whether or not people are going to a farmer's market, but it also may change things like who's stopping, who's if you're in a, an area with a lot of second homeowners or vacationers, are they going to be there to engage with whatever's going on in your area if the weather conditions are stormy all weekend, maybe they're just not going to go. And so being able to figure out that pairing of weather conditions and kind of the psychology of the customer, the, the behavior patterns of your customers. And it seems like that would be just at farmer's markets, but as someone who used to be a produce manager in a grocery store, I can tell you that that is not the case. It makes a huge difference what the weather looks like in terms of what sells in a grocery produce department. A huge difference. And so if you're selling to a grocery store, the weather conditions are going to change the orders they place with you. And so being able to make some connections can help you in terms of planning. Um, I want to specify, somebody asked in the chat, those are just Excel spreadsheets. Um, I made those and I just keep using them. The idea of being able to do something yourself in a spreadsheet program that makes sense to you and has things in the order that um, that work for you is I, this is not, this isn't rocket science. Um, you can do it. And if you have any questions, you can email Jeff and I can help you or someone else can help you with it. Um, but the idea of making sure that you're keeping track of what you need to is important. And I love Excel for that because it's so easy or other spreadsheet programs, but I happen to love Excel because of the, um, because of the functions, and I've learned over the years a number of functions. I, I've definitely worked with some other folks with Google Sheets and with um, Open Office as well. So I I am a big fan of Excel. I have, uh, I have learned a lot of functions in all three of those, but I think that Excel at this point just has more functions. So if you're asking for complex math to be done for you, it is sometimes easier. And it's a business expense to have your business pay for Microsoft if it would help you. Um, so I I sometimes do strong arm people if we're, they're asking very complex things that basically break Google Sheets to consider paying for Microsoft. Um, I do go from paper notes in the field to an Excel spreadsheet, to many Excel spreadsheets. I am a big fan of analog, um, partially because I live in an area that does not have reliable internet everywhere. And I don't have electricity in a lot of places where it would make sense to have um, to track things. I would have to buy multiple weather uh, sturdy. I don't know if that's even a thing that you can get very easily um, computers and then keep good track of them and bring them in to charge them on a regular basis. And that doesn't happen. So I have clipboards. I, I literally have clipboards in various places and I have a printed version of uh, in every Excel spreadsheet, in terms of the data that I'm tracking, I have a print version. The printed version goes on the clipboard. There's a clipboard um, at my potting table. There's a clipboard in my in my harvest and my wash station. Um, <clears throat> there's a clipboard in my car for deliveries. Um, I need the data tracking information to be where I'm going to be when I have the information in my face. And that's just how my business has had to work. Um, I know some people who have everything digitized from the beginning, and I got to tell you, I'm a little impressed that they can manage it. Um, but it's really figuring out what system works for your business is figuring out what system works for your business. So you can talk to everybody else to get information about it. But ultimately, if it doesn't work for you and your business, it's not the right system for you. Um, and that's why I love having spreadsheets, because then you can just tailor them. And there's always an option of setting a print. Um, a print function. Uh, so we're going to take a moment and talk about inventory. It's a system that a lot of people think about. Um, I think it's a system that more people think about than actually have. But in terms of any system that you're setting up, uh, any record keeping system you're setting up, there are the same questions that you're going to ask yourself. What's your goal? Is there a reporting need? 
What resources do you have? Who's going to build the system? Who's going to own the system? That's the maintenance and, and digitizing information if you're starting with analog. And how often are you going to check on it? Um, if it's one or two people in a business, it's often harder for people to think through all these things. But it really does make sense if you're trying to build a system that, to meet a need going through these kinds of questions to make sure that the system builds toward that goal and has all the information you need to be able to, to work on that goal. Why might you do this? In terms of inventory specifically, there are lots of reasons. Um, and you may have reasons that aren't on this list. And if there's something, I, this is not a comprehensive list. What are some other reasons to make sure you haven't all fallen asleep? complete silence. All right, folks, why do you keep your inventory? Or why would you like to keep your inventory if you don't keep it yet? And I'm not going to tell, you don't have to tell um, whether or not you keep an inventory right now. Get compost out of the cooler. I love it. What's going bad? How long has it been there? Um, I've also seen rotation. Inventory is really, really good for figuring out what to rotate. Um, I worked with a couple of meat farms that weren't getting the butcher cuts that they needed because they were running out of stuff that they, and they ended up needing to lose some, uh, do some very specific adjustment adjustments to their next couple of orders to try to balance out. And at first they were just like, why do we keep running out of certain things, right? How much do I have to sell before fall? De-stocking. I like the idea of de-stocking. Selling everything out, right? <clears throat> Seeing what we can donate. Um, I Just knowing, right? Just knowing what you've got. Updating the marketing efforts. If you need to try to sell through stuff, you need to know what you've got to be able to do it. And you need to know with enough lead time to be able to get that information out there. This is when the algorithms don't help us because I typically see same day sale posts from local farms in my area. And I follow a number of local farms in my area, partially because they're my friends and partially because, you know, it's good marketing to do so. Um, I usually see them about three days after the sale is over because the algorithm doesn't put them at the front of, of my feed. Um, so the more lead time you have, the better it might be in terms of actually getting people to see that stuff. So those are all great reasons. Here are some things in terms of the business-driven stuff. Inventory patterns. When are you going to do it and why? So an, a, an accurate annual accrual adjustment if you keep your books in an accrual fashion. If you don't, we'll talk about that another time. But the idea of being able to really clearly know how much product you have on hand for the purposes of moving information from one one year of financial records to another. And you may have a quarterly accrual adjustment. If you've ever gone to a store and seen those little weird pieces of paper that end up sticking out all over the place, most stores do that quarterly and it's part of an accrual adjustment. It's usually accountant driven. They have fiscal quarters. If they're big enough, they really are tracking things on a quarterly basis like that. And then in terms of sales and order driven aspects, there, there might need to be a monthly assessment of product. What do you have left? Um, and especially for for products that don't go bad quite so quickly, um, having that monthly assessment of product might be it might be a, a correcting of your ongoing inventory, the the like double check count, or it might be that that's when uh, you need to really consider what the coming month is going to look like, and you do a very robust monthly or for some businesses weekly assessment of what you've got. And then the idea of the continual inventory is great, but it's it's sometimes more aspirational than actual for a lot of a lot of businesses. This is an inventory that I made up. Again, it's an Excel spreadsheet, and I made it up because I had a client who needed one. Um, it's not easy to read when it's blank, so I'm going to put some information into it. I borrowed this information from Real Pickles in terms of their product list and their pricing. The idea is that one of the things we can do for <laughs> 
pardon me, for at least some of our businesses in terms of adding resilience is creating a value added or processed food um, that we may use if we have extra or if we're planning on having extra to extend our season. There are so many reasons that we end up looking at these things. And that doesn't necessarily mean that it's the right move for every business. It's not some, there are all kinds of new considerations that you'll end up looking at if you want to add an enterprise that involves, you know, certified kitchen space. But for the purposes of having never worked with real pickles and having them being somebody that you've probably heard of and probably tasted, um, and something that you'd be able to do if you were growing, you know, beets and cabbage um, and cucumbers and you had extra or you had to harvest everything all at once because of weather events, having something to do with them. Um, because that's the kind of resiliency that we end up talking about, at least informally among farmers. How am I going to extend my season? How am I going to deal with the variability? What are you doing? This is something that some people are doing. I also took the prices from their website. If you buy a case of beet kvass from Real Pickles website, you pay about six bucks a bottle. Um, the way that I have this set up is that there are, there's the annual page that gives you the summary, and then there's individual dates that people are, are adding information in for. So each month has its own page. There's a starting inventory that pulls from the annual. So you do one adjust or one uh, assessment right at the beginning of the year and put in what you have. And then you can make those adjustments every time you go to a market or you have stuff coming from the kitchen. The list to make the text a little bit bigger um, says to or from, and it does add or subtract based on whether it's to or from. Um, farmer's market, farm store, wholesale, special order, kitchen, and co-packer. I don't have the impression that Real Pickles works with a co-packer. I believe they do it all in-house. The idea of that there are two main ways to process food into value-added food. One of them is doing it on-site or doing it within the business, which is usually a kitchen, or doing it outside of the business, which may be a co-packer. Um, handing everything over to the folks who make sauerkraut as like their whole business and you you say all this stuff is mine and it goes into the stuff with your the jars with your label on it comes back to you and you sell it from your fridge um and i want to specifically put that out there because it's something we often don't think about and it's a great way for some businesses to have that added enterprise without the added labor it costs more to have it done in some ways but it costs less to have it done in others so figuring out what is going to work for your business and how to track that is the whole point, right? And of course, there's that accountability that we talked about earl earlier. If there's data entry, where, who, and what? Anybody who makes adjustments, anybody who touches it should initial it. I feel that way about invoices too. If you touch a piece of paper in my business, I want your initial thought. Um, and then periodic adjustments. Are, how often do you have to look at this? Weekly, monthly, quarterly, annually? If it's a new process, if it's a new system, you're probably going to be looking at it more often. As it becomes a system that you are much more familiar with, you might be looking at it in terms of adjusting it less often, but the data entry will still end up having to happen fairly frequently. You might, you might only be putting the information in from that analog to digital once a week, but if it's something that you want to be looking at daily, having the time and the capacity built in and as part of your staffing to be able to do that is important. And then also things like who's doing that? Is it considered administrative time? Is it time that's part of an, a specific enterprise or production? How are you asking people to track that? And then system maintenance. I have actually seen both of these be an issue. So even if you're laughing behind your muted, um, your muted and, and face covered way, does the person with the responsibility to maintain the system have access to the system and can they maintain it from there? Um, the fact that I've had people say, you know, well, it's not updated. Well, who, who's supposed to be updating? Well, that person. Can they access it? It doesn't look like you've given them access. They're like, oh no, it didn't give them access. Of course they can't hold up their end of that agreement, right? And then does the farm have a backup copy? Um, if you have a bunch of people able to access a Google document or an Excel document, do you have a pristine copy for when somebody accidentally deletes something that was important? I hope so. If you don't have them now, please have them for next year. It will someday, hopefully never be an issue for you, but it has been for some people and it is a bit of a mess when it happens. <laughs> With every, every system that we build, basically the questions you ask are the same, right? So if you're trying to catch 
all, put all of the labor um, hours that are going into your business, trying to track those in a system, you have to create the system to meet your goals. What's your goal with tracking it? Is there a reporting need? What resources do you have? Who's going to build the system? Who's going to own the system? And how often are you going to check on it? These are the same things that were on the inventory list. They're the same questions that I ask myself every time I'm building a new system, because these are the aspects that end up needing to be built in. And so asking them all at the beginning makes it an easier build often to try to get all of those, all of those checkpoints at the beginning. Some reasons that you may be inspired to focus on labor right now for your business. You may have state complaints from your staff about unclear systems or incorrect checks. If this is an issue, please talk to a professional accountant or bookkeeper for dealing with that. Um, but additionally, things like planning for additional labor. You want to build your business, you're planning and ex on expanding your revenue. To do that, you expect to have more labor. What does that look like? How are you going to plan to make sure you have the money to be able to pay that labor so you don't have the problem in line one? What kind of efficiencies are you looking to build and how does how are you going to be able to build those if you can't see what's going on right now? So being able to see what's going on now so that you can make adjustments to make a more efficient work situation for you and your staff. Assessing your cost of production, which often then means by enterprise, or assessing adding new products or enterprises, and assessing or adding or changing marketing channels. Should we go to that other farmer's market? That's all, you know, there's always that question of like, should, should we do this? Um, should we add this marketing channel? And you need to be able to look at what you're doing now and having more information about what's going on now allows you to make adjustments to see what that might look like. It gives you something to change or adjust when making those pro projections instead of starting from scratch. And starting from scratch are often wildly inaccurate numbers, especially for labor. So there are some options. There are definitely apps that are trying to do this all for you, which can be really great. I've seen it work really well for some farms, but it's also asking folks to use their smartphones as a time clock, which can be a little risky. Um, some staff really prefer it. Some staff really refuse to do it. Um, at least if you're in Massachusetts, you can't require people to use their phones as the time clock, or you couldn't a few years ago anyway, because I had somebody asked me to check. Um, so making sure that you have a system that works for you and your staff and also fits all of the legal requirements you have if you have staff is really helpful. Less formal ways to do it, or if you're not having an issue in terms of paying them, but you wanna see what enterprises or what tasks are really taking up people's time, having people estimate, um, having them do it at lunch and at the end of the day in terms of what they've done that morning or that afternoon, how long each of their tasks took, um, or doing time trials on a particular basis and then extrapolating that information. But if you're doing time trials, and you're just keep keeping track of it for a shorter period of time, it might be for a week, a couple of times a year. Well, if you have pretty big differences in terms of what tasks you're doing or how much time you're focusing on different tasks in the spring, summer, and fall, you want to track those in each season. Um, and your time versus new staff's time versus experienced staff's time to do the same task can be wildly different. Um, and so if you do have staff, it's it can be important to have different staff members keep track or all of your staff members keep track for us for a period of time. Um, I've noticed that some places have rearranged how their staff work after doing those kinds of time trials because they're seeing either who would help each other or they're seeing that certain people just aren't engaged in the same way in certain tasks. Now, everybody's got to weed the carrots, right? Everybody's got to pick the beans. But there are certain things where if you know someone is really on it in terms of washing greens and they're twice as fast as that other person, there's a point where it really makes sense to kind of build things around the the talents you've got that you're already paying. Um, and then of course, big projects are hiccups, not just planning for extra time with projects or figuring out how much time projects actually took, but something went wrong or you're planning for a big project and then you're tracking specifically within that. And I do think of hiccups as being, you know, something going awry, whether that's that there was a flood in a field and so everything else stopped and you had to go try to pull what you could before the water hit certain foods or it's before your machinery floated away or whatever it is. You want to keep track of those things because ultimately your business has to cover all of those costs 
and you want to know what kind of percentage of time you're putting out fires, as it were, as opposed to the things that you plan to be spending your time on. And that includes your time. A lot of us are prone to say that, there, that your own time is free at first because you may not be paying yourself at first. But if you're not accounting for it, you can't plan to pay yourself more or more regularly. Um, you can't really plan to reduce the hours you're working if you don't know how much you're doing now. And that may be hiring more staff or hiring staff like a manager to do some of the tasks that you're doing now. It's just for building financial resilience and setting prices that are appropriate for your business, eventually selling the business or having a, su a succession plan to hand it off to another generation. One of the things that um, has become increasingly an issue in businesses in the past few years is having someone just have to leave for a couple of weeks because they have gotten sick, particularly they've gotten COVID. And so you can't be sending someone to the farmer's market for a couple of weeks if they've had COVID, right? So making sure that you're prepared for the kind of adjustments that you may need. If you're doing all of this stuff, what happens when someone else has to do it instead? So how many hours are you working? You may not keep track of it all the time. I certainly don't, but I estimate periodically to see how many hours I'm spending on different tasks to really think about, is this the best use of my time? Why am I spending so much time on this thing? I need a better system for this. All that kind of comes up when I'm looking at, at my hours. How many hours would you need to replace yourself? That's a really important question because you can probably do things a lot faster than a lot of other people could. So if you were needing to replace yourself for two weeks because you got COVID or for longer because you injured yourself, um, would it take twice as many hours? And then how much would it cost for you to pay other people to do that? And do you have the financial capacity to do so do you have <laughs> do you have money in the bank, or do you have the ability to pull it, to pull money from, uh, say, a line of credit for something like that if it were to happen? But also, when it comes to calculating cost of production, you need to pretend you're paying somebody else to do your work. So it can be important to track that kind of information before you go through the cost of production um, assessment, so that you know that if you can plant things twice as fast as someone else you're pretending that you're paying two people to do it when setting, uh, when assessing your cost of production. <clears throat> so when you do look at your cost of production for a particular product, and this is product specific, so there are a couple of ways to do cost of production in terms of your business. Right For tonight, we're gonna talk about just product specific calculations. So you're gonna be looking at getting the crop into the ground and getting the crop out of the ground. When you put things into the ground, you're not thinking about them by case, you can't. And when you get things out of the ground, you're not thinking about them by acre. So we're going to work with getting the crop into the ground by acre or by row in this instance, um, and getting it out of the ground by case or by pound. And when you're doing that, you're looking at basically the supplies and the labor in either sense. So I have packaging as the supplies in part two, um, but ultimately the stuff and the people. So we're going to do this as an example with summer squash, if you have four beds of 100 feet per bed of summer squash, which is at one row per bed, you have 400 row feet. I hope nobody is completely asleep by the math. I apologize, but it, it's kind of necessary. So the steps are then track the costs going into the ground, track the costs coming out of the ground, track the yield, and then you can do the math to determine the cost by standard meters. You're going to, I've heard it called same sizing. You're going to make it so that you can see a particular number that you can then expand or make smaller so that if next year you wanna do six beds instead of four beds, you would be able to extrapolate those numbers and say, okay, well, we can, we can just multiply this number and get the, the information that we need. So when stuff is going in per planting, you're looking at what the supplies cost, potting soil and trays, seeds, mulch, amendments, if you're doing this for your own business, just start from the beginning and think through all of the steps that it takes to get from standing in the greenhouse thinking, I'm going to have to plant some summer squash today. I'm going to seed trays of summer squash today, all the way through to everything being in the ground. And that includes bed prep, weeding, and mulching in terms of the labor. We're not looking at the costs of some of those things right now. We have the cost of mulch, but we don't have the cost of bed prep or tractor use 
in this because that's something that a lot of farms, especially small ones, are thinking of more as a, a total farm administrative use. I wouldn't be able to personally on my farm assign a certain amount of time to just the four beds of summer squash versus the beds of, say, zucchini or the beds that were next to it this year of kale um, and collards. So that's something that larger farms or form farms, I've seen flower farms have very specific bed prep estimates, but it's something that is not generally where people start. So ultimately, for this planting of 400 bed feet, we have $70 worth of supplies and $280 worth of labor. I want to, I want to say that again, $280 worth of labor, worth of labor, not necessarily paid labor this year, right? But this is how much it would cost, assuming that you are paying people at or a little bit above the minimum wage in Massachusetts, which is $15 an hour. I have it all estimated as $20 an hour, as many of you probably have figured out by now. But the reason that I do that is that if you are paying someone $15 an hour, you are actually, the cost of the business is often $18 to $20 an hour, possibly depending on how, what your insurance looks like for having staff. Um, but also you may not be paying everyone $15 an hour. You might be paying somebody who's was coming back from last year, paying them more per hour because they have more experience and they presumably are going to work a little bit faster. So you want to take that into account when you're making these kinds of, of assessments. Um, and it can be really helpful to have a sense of how much the average per hour is that you're paying people so that you can do this. So if you have staff, it's great to do that. Otherwise, if you're in Massachusetts, at least $20 an hour is a great way to estimate so that you are planning for paying staff at least minimum wage and maybe a little bit more. So the total cost for this planting going in is $350. When it's coming out from your harvest tracking, you're going to see um, how much time and you're gonna see, uh, say the waxed boxes and rags. If you're not gonna have everybody track how much it actually took per case in terms of their labor. You're gonna say that you picked 10 cases on this date and it took this amount of time and you're going to pull that information and turn it into the per case number. Um, I do wanna say not everybody uses rags in this instance, but um, it's the way that I was taught to on an organic farm in Vermont. And so that I wanted to make sure that there was a note that anything that it is involved in getting the squash from the field into the cases and in into the storage space ready to go out um, to sale is included. So I added rags for that reason. You might not use them, that's fine. But the idea of any additional costs that are specific to the squash would be part of the cost of having the squash in the case at the end. It's part of the production of squash. So then for each case, you have $4.75 worth of supplies and $10 worth of labor. So the cost of getting the squash out of the field is $14.75 per case. Now we're gonna standard size it. We're gonna make it so that we can fill in all of these boxes. So we have the information about cost going into the ground for the whole planting. We have the number of cases that were salable. This should actually be the number of cases that you sold. If uh, I listed it as salable, but if you only sold 30 of your 36 salable cases, those 30 cases, it would be 30, it wouldn't be 36. So you got 36 cases, you sold all of them. And then you also had dinner, because I mean, you don't get a half a case, right? If you're picking cases, you're selling full cases, you don't get a half a case, you get dinner. And then there's the cost per case um, and the cost per pound, which you can pull because it's a 22 pound case of squash. So we're gonna do the math quickly to get, we're gonna have them, let's do the math for us so that you can get a sense of what all of that costs. You have the full cost for the planting, the cost per case, and the cost per pound. The important part here is that this is just the cost of the squash getting into the case. It doesn't account for the delivery costs or the selling costs. This is the production costs, just seeds and soil to case of squash. Um, but also it's variable from one round to another. I said earlier, I do three rounds of squash per year. So these are made up numbers. These are not my numbers. The idea of doing some cost for planting, um, it, those, they might not have tracked the labor differently every time, but there was a problem in round three. A chipmunk ate a bunch of the squash seeds and the seeding happened, happened, had to happen over again. 
the number of salable cases is not the same in every planting, no matter what you do. So keeping track of that can make a really big difference. And then the cost per case is different because the number of salable cases is different. So as you're looking at what the cost is, there are two ways to do it. One of them is looking at the average and planning for that. And the other way, especially if you can do this in, in your area, is to plan for the highest or a higher than your average cost. Because remember, the number of cases you sell has to cover all of the expenses of the planting plus all of the additional expenses associated with running your business. They have to pay their share of that. So we want to make sure that you can add a little bit of buffer in. So if you're in an area where you can charge that little bit more and costs, assume that your cost is going to be $34 a case instead of 27 and a quarter, that can make a huge difference in terms of what amount of money is in the bank at the end of the year. We're gonna, <clears throat> sorry, we're gonna keep going forward um, and then have the questions all the way at the end. But if you have any questions, feel free to type them in now. The reason is I wanna make sure we talk about the farm financial calendar and I know that we're a little bit short on time. So I wanna make sure that we, we look at this for a moment. The farm financial calendar is a tool that the CARA project has. The reason that it's there is that building systems can be hard, especially from scratch and especially with financial stuff because there are best practices, they exist, and you and I may not know them as we're trying to set up our business, especially if we're doing it for the first time. This tool does a couple of things. One of them is that it gives you a checklist of what needs to be done when, and also a, lar a detailed checklist for larger projects. Um, and it's a great reference for infrequent actions. So the last thing is it actually reminds you that it's from the CARE project, and so there's somewhere you can ask for help. So if you're feeling overwhelmed when you're doing annual stuff, you can it says right on it who, who built it, and then you can, um, you can say, oh, yes, I need to go to the CARE project. This is what it looks like. This is part one. This is the general task list. I know you can't read any of this because the text is too small. But what it does in general is it tells you what you need to do. It tells you who is doing them, operational tasks and managerial tasks. And it tells you when you need to be doing them. It also tells you where to look in part two for the more complicated stuff, especially stuff you might not do as often and may need some reminders as to what detailed steps go into it. It's worth noting that all the stuff you do every day doesn't get complicated enough to need a smaller checklist. Part two is the detailed checklist and it tells you the task, the goal, I love the, that there's a goal because if there isn't a goal, sometimes it's hard for me to focus on why I need to do something. So it has the goal, right? Have enough cash to pay upcoming bills without bouncing checks and prioritize expenses as needed. That's a pretty good goal. I like not bouncing checks. And then it gives you the, uh, the details in the process as to what those steps are. Um, I found this tool so useful that I keep a copy, a printed, actual printed copy of it with the bill paying stuff that I have for my own business. Um, and last year we uh, did a workshop in person in, in Connecticut and we talked about this, but didn't have copies and people demanded copies. And so I took my physical copy out and we made copies <laughs> in the copy machine for everyone who was at the, um, at the, the workshop that day. This tool is at, at the moment, it's getting a little bit of a facelift. So if you're interested in having this tool for yourself, email Jeff, say, hey, I want a copy of that. And as soon as it's done getting a facelift, you will have it in your email. Now Jeff's gonna have to follow up with that. Sorry, Jeff. Um, I'm hoping that we'll be able to send it to everyone who um, is interested fairly soon, but we, we need to run it by uh, a design person, I think before it can, it's ready for prime time. So that's the end of what we did today, but I wanna take a moment and say that I know that there, there this, kind of leads a lot of people to ask more questions than, than it answers, right? Now that we're thinking about financial records and operational records for our businesses, we have all of the things for our businesses in our head. So I wanna make a point of pausing and saying, next month, we're gonna do break-even analysis and scenario planning. And then in February, we're gonna do sensitivity analysis and competitive analysis. So if you come back for those, you get to deal with me again. Hopefully I won't be coughing anymore. Um, and we can go through what those processes look like for your business.
Okay. Well, thank you. That's the end of, of my time. I'm going to ask Jeff to say um, so that. So is Jeff going to pop on here? Uh, I, I am hopped on. I thought okay, I uh, started my video. Uh, Kian, though, before I get to it, we do have one remaining question, and that's to go into a little bit more detail on cost of goods sold. I will start the conversation, if you don't mind, Kian, by saying um, cost of goods sold from an accountant's perspective, has a couple of different interpretations possible. Um, we find it most easily explained and simple to manage for most farms if you consider cost of goods sold only the cost of product that you're buying in for resale and not the cost of stuff that you have produced and use the system and charter accounts that Kian gave you an overview today to track and record that information. And it's recorded in that part of your charter of accounts versus cost of goods sold. And Kian, what else do you want to say? I was figuring that I would answer that after you talked about the care plan. Um, I, I think that's, that's pretty much on, on point for it. There are a couple of different ways of calculating cost of or assessing what's going into cost of goods sold. I am really strongly opinionated that what's going to work best for your business is what's going to work best for your business. So if you have a different system right now, I'm not going to tell you you're doing it wrong as long as it's being accounted for and you have a system and you can explain it to me and it makes sense, you're good. We just need to be able to build your system to fit your business. Um, but for a lot of folks being able to separate out the stuff that's for resale, where you're paying someone else to do the labor um, and do a lot of the kind of footwork for it versus the stuff you do in-house where you're incurring all of those expenses is often the breaking point. But I also will say that I come from a background of working in retail and cost of goods sold is the stuff you buy to turn around and sell again in retail. So I know that I have particular framing and that I'm more comfortable with that framing, but I can work in a place where I'm uncomfortable or less comfortable if it's what's right for the business I'm working for. And any of the other um, business assistance providers with the care project, even if they have their own opinions as to what often works best, they're going to work with what works best for you and your business. Great. Thanks, thanks Ken. Um, before I uh, say anything more, I just want to double check. Does anyone have any um, questions on what the content of, of tonight's presentation? And if you want to wait until after the recording is done so that you can ask a question that that you don't want to have recorded, that's okay too. Thanks, thanks, Ken. So, so Joe, is the tool, are you talking about um, the farm financial calendar when you say if it's on our website or um, or some other element? It, it as as can yes it will be eventually we've got two things going on um we've got a tech glitch in our website that we have to correct um but in this particular document the tool um it needs a facelift it was created you know way back in 2016 and um as you can see there's a lot of text it's pretty complicated and to do that we we've, we've got to get some some additional software or and or professional help to to bring it back up to, to snuff, so to speak, in terms of um, modernize it, right? We want to make sure that the language we're using um, has been adjusted, over, you know, to follow along with how people are speaking now versus way back then. But also know that it's in process. We're working on that right. because we want people to have this tool. Um, it's very helpful to a lot of folks, especially as you're getting used to the system and putting this into practice to begin with, um, I find that I don't have to look at my checklist anymore, but I've had it since 2016. And at first, it was literally on the wall behind my computer for the first two years that I had. It. So um, having uh, a lot of information, a lot of dense information is, is part and parcel of doing books, making it less confusing and giving everyone the support they need to be able to succeed at it. It's, it's a priority. 
and in terms of Excel sheets and so on, um, I, I can work to, you know, just email me. Um, my email is is on the screen here, jcole.carrotproject.org. Uh, and I can work with Key in to get you the most updated version of those Excel sheets. They will also um, be available on our website as soon as we get the tech issues solved. Um, but I don't want to make any promises. If you want to get going on working with those Excel sheets right away, um, we'll make it happen. So now I guess I, it's time for me to to uh, give you my little spiel, which which is pretty simple, which is um, a lot of this stuff um, has a lot of um, complexity to it. And as Keen has done a fabulous job of pointing out, it's always or it's usually helpful to have someone to who's experienced in doing these types of things to, to talk you through it, even if they're not doing the work alongside with you, but to talk talk you through the process um, can be a great step. Um, Amanda Chang and myself can uh, provide some coaching um, to you uh, if it's relatively general, uh, and that's as uh, easy as an email or a phone call away. Um, if it gets more time consuming and complex, we will find a business advisor to work with you, uh, and we set up a process of of um, identifying the advisor based upon what your goals and objectives are, um, connecting you to them. Um, they'll have a conversation, they'll set up a scope of work. So there's a, um, there's an agreement in black and white um, to lay out what everyone's expectations are. Uh, once that's um, agreed to, then, then we move forward. Our work is supported uh, by grants that we go out and solicit, if you will, on your behalf. We have decided to not get into a re-granting situation um, so that you're not involved in the financial reports to the grantor and so on. What that means is we pay the consultant directly on your behalf. Oftentimes, it's completely free. Other times, depending upon um, the resources we have, the particular nature of the grants that are funding the work, um, we use a household income as a proxy for capacity to pay and sometimes there is a cost share on your part but it's individual um our work is definitely focused uh in new england we rarely uh, have grants that would extend outside of those um states that's not to say though we can't provide the support it might be though that you have to contribute for almost all the resources if we're going to do it and depending on the state we may have um be able to refer you to other organizations similar to us uh, who might be able to also provide similar services with some sort of financial support. So that's sort of the the uh, the overview of uh, how we work. Uh, as I said, there's my contact information up there. I love talking with farmers, um, and um, I you know would be more than happy to have a chat with you to help you figure out what your next steps might be. I think of Jeff as the matchmaker. He has a short conversation often with uh, with a farmer or a food producer to find out what's going on. And he says, okay, I have you know three providers who might fit. I'm gonna stack them this way. And then he'll email us to see what that might look like for people. So who has the time, who has the capacity, who has the right tools to be able to support you in an efficient manner. Um, so he's, he's matchmaking the, the farmers with the business assistants um, based on what skills we have and who he thinks personality wise might work well together. So, and you, you're you well within your rights to specifically say, I don't want to have to listen to that guy that I listen to anymore. I would get, get, send me up with somebody else um, and say, I want somebody who helps me with my chart of accounts, but also doesn't do the workshops on it. And he can say you set up with one of my colleagues. Um, so figuring out what, you're looking for can be helpful and if you don't know what you're looking for but you know you need help we can help you with that too um, so i always encourage people to just reach out to jeff send him an email and you know it's all it all stays in house you know your information is is your information and we're really respectful of that thank you Keen. and you said a short conversation but just so you are aware um i'm a recovering farmer um uh, I, um, I I lease the land to do some tractor work for immigrant and refugee farmers. Um, but because I'm a farmer, um, a short conversation for me uh, is probably closer to an hour. I can I can be more 
six eight and make it less if that's what the time frame and time you have but um, i frequently get into you know chatting about um farming things with, with folks and i think i think it's usually helpful so so yeah that's it i see uh joe's got a question keen is there a standard yeah. markup um joe, uh, there are there are no standards in vegetable farming um in terms of financial standards for for margins and i tend to think in margins instead of markup um, but the idea of of what percentage over the cost of production you should be generating in terms of revenue, there's no standard. It's all based on what you need and what you can get in your market. And we talk about that a bit more in February um, when we talk about things like competition audits. So we will we'll get there. But in general, I'm sorry to say there are no rules here. Um, and it's all based on what your business needs. I agree with Keen, but I will say that just in terms of comparing yourself to the outside world, um, the standard markup for a supermarket is 100%. If they buy some That's of squash not for accurate, it, Jeff. It's not? No. It's changed? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I encourage people to have conversations with the markets where they're going to sell because it can be very different depending on the market you're in and who you're working with. You could be selling the same product to five different grocery stores and there will be five different prices in their produce departments. So it's worth having those conversations. And a lot of the produce managers um, will have and are eager to have those conversations with people for transparency's sake because when I was a produce manager, I definitely had farmers very mad at me um, for changing the pricing that they assumed would happen based on what they sold me and based on what I needed to sell it at to keep my job. Um, it didn't happen very often, but it happened a couple of times and it was not fun for anybody. So always reach out and have those conversations. They are in the business of selling produce. You are in the business of selling produce. There is a way for everyone to win in this business, but we, we have to be able to talk about it. Well, thank you, Keen. I guess I've been, I've been out of it too long. A uh, question on what time are the next two workshops? Um, uh, Kimberly, are you is yeah, there? I, I, can, I, I, I can pitch oh, in there. Oh, thank you. So the next workshops uh, will be December uh, 11th. And that one is just going to be a little bit early because I believe Hanukkah is starting. So we're going to have hmm. it between 3 to 5 p.m. And then our workshop after that, we are aiming to do uh, Jul uh, July, excuse me, January, January 22nd. Um, all the workshops will be on a Monday. Um, and that one is going to be our resource fair. And then I know Kian had mentioned his uh, February, remind me the date, was it 11th? I think it's the 5th. The 5th, yes. thank you. <laughs> so... Um, his what will be going back to the six to eight time window on that for that. So all the workshops will be uh, a six to eight time window on a Monday, all Eastern time and except December 11th, which would just be a little bit earlier because of Hanukkah. But just keep keep an eye on the new entry website and you'll be able to see and uh, access the recordings for this workshop today and then also uh, signing up for the workshops to come. And Kimberly, all of the times that you said are in Eastern time, right? They are all in Eastern time, yes. And Kimberly, there's a, qu a question uh, from Jennifer. Will we have access to the recordings? Um, I know yes. the answer is yes, but I'll let you explain the details. Sure. So we will be um, in the next week or two, we'll be posting onto our YouTube channel, the recording from uh, tonight and the workshops to come. Um, we're also going to be providing additional resources and a fact sheet associated with uh, today's uh, discussion and presentation. Um, for, so for each of our workshops, we'll have that associated materials as well. So hopefully that will help our farmers and you all digest a little bit more the materials and maybe providing some guidance around that as well. Any other questions? We're at 8 p.m. So um, I'd just like to thank you all, though, for coming. We had a wonderful turnout for the first workshop. You guys, y'all were great. And 
I know Kian had some some hard questions in there, or hopefully ones that kept you, kept you engaged. Uh, but thank you all, and uh, please let us know if you have any additional comments or concerns or questions. And we look forward to seeing you in the uh, presentations and workshops to come.